what is the best, or if you will, the right definition of development aid? I, I think the definitions that is presently used by the Development Assistance Committee of uh, the OECD is, is a pretty good um, uh, concept. It basically concerns uh, transfers from one, uh, one country to another, uh, official transfers um, that are meant, that are destined for development, and um, that has uh, a significant grant element uh, in built into it. In other words, uh, you put together both pure grants but also loans that have a substantial grant element. The issue, of course, is that uh, with this definition, there are certain aspects of <clears throat> private donations and others that are not captured by this. And this is becoming an increasing uh, problem. It's becoming increasingly clear that that particular part of what you would call development aid um, resources or flows has increased a lot. And it is important uh, that those uh, flows are also captured. But I think there is a, uh, when it comes to the definition of the development aid, I think we, 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 we are, are doing reasonably well with existing definition, except for that specific point I mentioned. So essentially it's about uh, public allocation of resources, traditionally. It, it is essentially about how uh, one country can help another country and its population to achieve higher standards of living. Yes, and, and so you just mentioned that uh, uh, this has been the traditional definition and, and more and more uh, private donations are becoming significant and so far this hasn't been uh, captured, right? Yeah, I mean it's clear that there is uh, an issue in relation to the capturing of that aspect of the total flow that mm -hmm. goes towards these objectives. I mean if you go to the uh, dark database, uh, there are certainly flows that we would refer to as uh, these private flows that are not captured. And of course, from an analytical perspective, we would like to <clears throat> have that better reflected. The problem being um, that whereas you have member states of the OECD that report uh, what they are doing, you don't have uh, the same registration of what uh, private actors do. And, and, and so we are left with sort of... So yes. we are left with trying to collect that from different <coughs> at present rather disparate sources. Mm -hmm. um, so that is uh, clearly something uh, that is lying ahead of us as a challenge that needs to be addressed. And, and private actors are, are nowadays significant enough that we should try to capture their contribution. Th th that's exactly right. I mean, uh, parts of, for example, the Gates uh, uh, funds are now being captured in some of these uh, numbers, but there are other uh, private flows that are not. Mm -hmm. And do we have an idea of what is the current distribution of, uh, of public aid and private aid? I mean, do we have an, a rough well, assessment? I, I, the, 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 since we don't have exact information here, we are talking about, uh, how can you say, uh, areas where you are uh, guesstimating, as we would sometimes say. But it is probably somewhere in the neighborhood of about maybe 20-25%. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's quite significant. It is something that is important, yes. Okay, so that's uh, the overall definition of uh, development aid. Now, of course, I mean, uh, development aid hasn't always existed, so uh, now that we have clarity, if you will, now that you gave us clarity on, on the notion of development aid itself, uh, tell us a bit about the, the history of, uh, uh, of development aid. You know, when did it start? Uh, why did it start? In essence, what was the, the rationale for it? Uh, um, and over time, you know, who have been the main donors and who have been the main recipients? So first of all, when did this start roughly? I, I think it's fair to say that development aid, um, as we know it today, that basically started after the Second World War uh, with the massive Marshall Plan through which the U.S. basically helped uh, the reconstruction of uh, Europe. The Marshall Plan was a really major international effort at rebuilding um, Europe, um, and it's very clear that at the time, um, the country that made these resources available, this means the US, made very significant amount of resources available 
uh, for this reconstruction effort. This, in many ways, has been defining in terms of how a lot of people and a lot of institutions have over the years thought about development aid, and it has also fueled uh, what I have sometimes called uh, over-optimistic expectations about what aid can do. Mm -hmm. It's clear that the Marshall Plan was incredibly um, successful. Uh, in, in a relatively short period of time, uh, through this influx of resources, essentially uh, Europe uh, was rebuilt, was reconstructed. Um, and uh, there's no question that the impact was visible. It's clear that um, as you then moved up through the 50s and into the 60s, then clearly what happened was that the development aid flow was directed uh, to other continents to places where what we saw was what some people have called underdevelopment, what we refer to as the developing world. And it's clear that the challenges that development aid has been targeted uh, to resolve in those countries were clearly bigger than what they were in Europe after the Second World War. A after the Second World War, basically what was the situation? Well, the situation was that Europe was physically destroyed. Infrastructure had been destroyed and so on and so forth. But it should not be forgotten that the, what we sometimes refer to as human capital, the capacity of people in terms of background training, education, <coughs> institutions and so on. Well, while the war obviously was destructive, well, it didn't destroy all of the human capital. There was a lot of people killed but there was still a lot of human capacity left. Institutions still existed. So what you can say is in such a situation, adding in that resource flow, it has the potential to relatively quickly help lift the whole system. Mm -hmm. And that happened. Yeah. Now, the, the challenge was, that was then addressed when we start talking about the developing world, about all those countries that became independent around 1960 is, of course, a much bigger challenge uh, because this is a challenge that involves institutional issues. It's not simply a matter of building some infrastructure. Mm -hmm. so, so the very nature of, of, of uh, development aid, uh, when we compare the Marshall Plan and then what was done in favor of uh, uh, developing countries was, was a bit different simply because the conditions of developing countries you know, were uh, very different, right? Yeah, you, you, th there was a lot of focus in the early years um, on reconstruction, on investment in, in, in the traditional physical sense, and that certainly was also the case in the early years of the aid that was challenged to developing countries. Mm -hmm. uh, the World Bank's uh, IBRD is actually the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development. Um, but it's clear that as we went through the decades, the role that aid was assigned to uh, fulfill changed. Originally, we were thinking a lot about investment. We were thinking a lot about investment in infrastructure and so on and so forth. Uh, lots of projects were implemented, which were basically uh, designed to be specific, discrete investment projects. But then as time went by, it became clear that there are broader societal issues, there are broader institutional issues, there are broader governance issues, and so on, uh, that it was then expected that aid should help try to resolve. One aspect of this was, for example, um, in the beginning, lots of the aid actors were expecting, okay, it's okay to focus on investment and growth, because growth will then take care of poverty reduction. Mm -hmm. But it has then, of course, been learned over the years that, well, not any kind of growth is good for poverty reduction. Mm -hmm. And that you don't always get the same amount of poverty reduction uh, for the same amount of growth. So you need to think about the kind of growth pattern that you are pursuing. So when you start opening up for those kinds of dis discussions, then, of course, you're opening up for a broader menu 
uh, of roles for foreign aid. Mm -hmm. And 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 the initial the initial rationale for for uh, for aid. I mean, was it uh, w w w you know was it a matter of, of solidarity? Was it a matter of uh, uh, strategic thinking in terms of well, you know, if Europe, for instance, uh, you know, uh, gets rebuilt, or if developing countries uh, uh, end up developing, then it will be good for for the U.S. It will be good for the developed world. So so the 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 rationale was it, and I guess it was a combination of both. Was it pure solidarity or was it strategic thinking, pragmatic thinking? It, it, it is clear that the motivations uh, behind uh, foreign aid, and in, that includes uh, when you go back to the Marshall Plan and so on, includes uh, on the one hand definitely uh, concerns about the fact that uh, it's not good um, either for the people who are suffering poverty and need, um, but that not being good for that, those people, that's a humanitarian concern, if you wish, an egalitarian concern, at least some sort of concerns about justice uh, and so on. That has always been coupled with uh, what you can call, uh, consider more shrewd political uh, motivations. It's clear that the um, aid from the U.S. has uh, been very much motivated by, uh, how can you say, counteracting what was seen as communist uh, influence from uh, the Soviet Union and its allies, it's very clear that, that, that the aid was part of that um, uh, whole political uh, economy situations. Mm -hmm. um, when, when, when you look to more academic work on uh, what are the uh, principles, what are the uh, factors that drive foreign aid, you, you find the whole range uh, you find political aspects, you find humanitarian aspects, uh, you find commercial aspects, and, and, and so on. It's all there. Mm -hmm. um, and, and one way to illustrate that is um, basically to look at total aid flows and then ask the question, what happened to those aid flows uh, when the Cold War ended? Well, they dropped very significantly. Really? Of course, because some of the Cold War uh, drivers behind the aid uh, were being reconfigured. Mm -hmm. So, and in terms of the, the the main donors, and of course this has evolved over time. But uh, uh, you know, if we if we were able to to map, uh, you know, uh, the, the the main actors in terms of public allocation of resources in the context of aid. So, who, who would be these people? I mean, we or these actors. We started, I guess, with the U.S. and then. It, it is clear that the U.S. Um, was and still is um, a, a major actor. Um, but where the US was a, a really a big actor, also relatively speaking, uh, in the early years, in the early years, the US gave uh, you know, up to 3% of its national income as part of the Marshall Plan. Um, today, the share uh, of its national income that the US gives in foreign aid is down to 0.2%. Mm -hmm. So you can say, if you wish to uh, use that uh, terminology, you can say that the U.S. effort inside the U.S. has gone down mm -hmm. because it used to be much, a much bigger share of the national income of the U.S. than it is today. But because the U.S. has grown and because the U.S. is such a big economy, in absolute term, uh, terms, the U.S. aid is still a very significant flow. Mm -hmm. But you have clearly seen other countries uh, being that uh, bigger uh, uh, European countries as France and Germany. Uh, you have seen the Nordic countries, while relatively small economies, um, are playing a big role because they tend to give much closer or above uh, the UN target of 0.7% in development aid uh, of, of the national income. So because they have, are giving such a higher share of their national income. Obviously, they are a bigger share of the total. Japan is a very important international donor. Uh, Japan is uh, a big economy, and it is providing uh, uh, resources. Um, Canada is there, and so on. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and who are the main recipients? The main uh, beneficiaries uh, of, of this aid. I mean, uh, is there a map of uh, development aid, a geographical map? 
What you can say is that it's clear that in the earlier years that there was a very considerable focus on a number of Asian countries. It's clear that, for example, India received a substantial amount of foreign aid. South Korea received a very substantial amount of foreign aid. It's clear that you have a number of Asian countries. China has also received substantial aid. So it's clear that there was a lot of focus on Asia. It's clear that as we look to the last sort of 30 years, focus has shifted more towards African countries. I think one thing that's important to remember here is, of course, that if you go back and look to the numbers of poor people, if you go 30 years back, the big numbers were still in Asia, simply because the Asian population was and is so much bigger. One of the reasons why you have seen the shift more towards Africa in these latter decades is clearly because you have seen less general economic development in Africa. So the projections have tended to be more pessimistic, suggesting that Africa and African countries will have more need when we look to the future. And that's why sort of aid has been gradually shifted. But Vietnam, for example, is still a major recipient of aid. And if you go 10 years back, Vietnam was the largest aid recipient in absolute terms. Really? If, oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, um, uh, so, so one needs to keep these things in mind when, when we are discussing this. Uh, countries like uh, Nepal has received a lot of uh, support, uh, Bangladesh has, and so on. If, if you then focus on, on, on African countries, then what you see is that you see uh, some countries that have received over the years uh, considerable aid. Mozambique has received considerable aid, Tanzania has received considerable aid, um, Kenya, uh, Ghana. There is a very large number of countries in Africa that have received um, uh, important amounts of aid as we look towards these past uh, four decades. I think, however, it's important when we are discussing um, foreign aid to think about it both in relation to the absolute numbers, which is what uh, is often uh, put in the press. But sometimes when you see it from the side of the recipient, uh, and sometimes when, I, when I'm discussing these issues with, with people in a more broad context, I ask, so how much do you think that an average person uh, in Africa or an average person um, in Tanzania, for example, receives in foreign aid per year. Uh, Sometimes people expect that these numbers are really very, very big. Mm -hmm. Uh, They sometimes say, oh, maybe we pay them $1,000 per person a year or something like that, because they have heard that these numbers are really big. Well, in a country like Tanzania, the amount of money that actually goes to Tanzania, when you add all that up, is about thirty thirty five dollars per, uh, per, per per Tanzanian citizen per, per year, year. per year. I, I, I'm not price. saying. I, I I'm not saying uh, that this is uh, uh, not worthwhile uh, to discuss, plan, and use properly. But I am saying that when we think about the development challenges that are there when we think about what it costs to build a road uh, from whatever, when we think about some of these costs that are associated with bringing countries into development processes, uh, clearly uh, you you may want to think about those dimensions when you think about what aid can achieve. Uh, You you mentioned that initially it's uh, uh, Asia which received quite a bit, I mean India, South Korea, China. Is it simply because the the number of poor people in this country was uh, enormous or is it because there was a a, a strategic value in helping these countries in geopolitical terms? I I don't think there's any question uh, that the reason for um, being uh, supporting India uh, clearly was because there was a history, uh, 
India is a very large, almost continent. There was a long uh, colonial history with the UK. I think it was understood um, that the world would be a better place if you maintain a process of development uh, in that uh, part of the world. It's clear that uh, a lot of support has been going into Pakistan over the years, both development but also uh, more motivated by political aspects. Uh, that, of course, is part of the present-day discussion. Um, so I think that it's understood that um, the aid is given both in order to promote development, broadly speaking, but certainly also as, as, as part of a political process. U.S. aid has over the years, to a very large extent, been uh, uh, geared towards uh, Israel and, and Egypt. Mm -hmm. I mean, a very significant part of U.S. aid has been uh, given to these two countries. Yeah. Uh, we see now, of course, that a very significant part of the aid is now going uh, towards, for example, Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so clearly the, the, the strategic motivations are, are here. You, you also, when it comes to uh, Asia, you, you mentioned China. Uh, was uh, development aid uh, critical for, uh, uh, for the development of China? I mean pre-1978 and then uh, post-1978? I think that the uh, foreign aid to China has played a critical role in a, a number of uh, um, areas where foreign technology, uh, human capacity, um, and simply knowledge has played a significant role. Um, Am I saying that aid is the driver in China? No, I'm not. Um, but I think that it has played a, an important uh, part in, in, in the overall uh, picture. It's very clear that uh, if you, for example, look at the uh, celebrations that took place last year where uh, the World Bank and, 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 and China were celebrating their uh, many decades of collaboration, um, both parties recognize that this has been an important uh, element, uh, not the driving one, but it has been a useful supporting uh, aspect of it. If you go to a country like uh, Korea, South Korea, it's very clear uh, that the very, very significant uh, foreign aid that has uh, be, uh, that was given is a, was a very, very simpo uh, important part of the uh, uh, South Korean success, mm -hmm. um, and, and something that we sometimes in our present day discussions underestimate is actually the extent of um, uh, US backed uh, educational programs uh, mm -hmm. that took place. Um, this has played a very substantial role uh, in building up uh, the necessary human capital in the Korean case, training people to a very high level. Um, and, and still, for example, if you then think just about the Chinese case, uh, what comes to mind right now was just, there's been a very significant pro program of collaboration uh, with the University of Chicago that has trained a very significant number uh, of the new Chinese uh, economists that are playing now critical roles both in China uh, and, by the way, in the World Bank. The chief economist of the World Bank uh, is a Chinese trained uh, at the University of Chicago. Actually, I mean, you know, it's, it, it's interesting, Finn, that you're mentioning this. Yesterday, we had a video conversation with Professor Wang, who is both uh, from uh, Tsinghua and the University of Chinese University of Hong Kong, who is a, a political economist, and he was telling us that actually, at a critical moment, Milton Friedman uh, was visiting China and interacting with the uh, Chinese policymakers on all these issues. So it's interesting mm -hmm. that you're mentioning this. And and. Yeah. Uh, Ahead, but, but, but let me just stress that, of course, not all these contacts have been funded by foreign aid, yes. but a very significant part of these interactions actually were possible, actually uh, took place as an integral part of educational programs and collaborations that were supported by foreign aid. Uh, and so for China, I mean, uh, what mattered most, uh, based on what you're saying, is really uh, the, 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 the focus on human capital, technology, knowledge, rather than the focus on, on uh, direct uh, allocation of financial resources. Yes, I mean, um, th th there were also some major investment programs done, but it's very clear that the relationship between, yes. uh, in relation to China has been different from it has been in other cases.
But if you go to um, some of the African countries, it's very clear that if you, for example, look to the uh, early years, it's very clear that some of the major uh, programs were focused a lot on let's make sure we get some of the infrastructure right. But then gradually it became perceived that, well, investment projects may not yield a return if you are not having an overall conducive economic and social context. So then much more attention was gradually paid to that. Um, more attention was paid to addressing uh, poverty issues directly rather than indirectly uh, through growth. Mm -hmm. Then what you can say is that as we then got to the uh, late 1970s where we had seen the impact of the oil crisis, what we saw then was that a lot of developing countries entered into deep economic crisis. It was felt that they needed to adjust their economies, their economic policies. So then a new modality, it wasn't completely new, but it, it started to play a much bigger role, which essentially was part of a uh, discussion and negotiation. Some would say it was part of the international finance institution imposing themselves, uh, money would be provided on the uh, agreement that a certain country would introduce, would implement policy changes. Mm -hmm. And this then became part of what has sometimes been called aid provided based on conditionality. Uh, Finn, you mentioned when it comes to Africa the, the, the fact that Mozambique, Tanzania, Kenya, Ghana receive quite a bit of money. Uh, these are essentially you know, Eastern African countries. One country, which is actually not really a, an Eastern African country, uh, that you didn't mention, Congo, and yet the needs in Congo are enormous. I mean, w what has been the track record of development no, aid no, in Congo? Um, well, I, I mean, um, you should not understand uh, that uh, development aid has not gone into uh, uh, Congo. I mean, uh, it has. I mean, um, uh, the World Bank, for example, has been an active uh, uh, investor. Uh, it's very clear that on the previous regimes, um, uh, quite substantial amounts of resources actually went in. And some of the disappointment or some of the, how can you say, backlash or criticisms of uh, foreign aid I mean, clearly comes from some of those experiences where aid uh, was continuing to come in, even if you would sort of see the uh, existing ruler or the existing regime uh, being uh, quite far uh, from being respectable. And then, of course, uh, questions started to be asked. There's no question that the aid fatigue of the 1980s uh, was very much linked uh, to criticism, to disappointment um, in relation to a number of countries where you saw uh, dictators and regimes where it was pretty obvious that they were not really targeted on using the aid properly or using the aid in the best way. Um, the present situation in Zimbabwe is, 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 is sort of a parallel. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in your list of uh, recipient uh, uh, countries or regions, you, uh, you didn't mention the Middle East and, uh, and, and Latin America. I mean, uh, what's the situation on these two regions? Uh, I mean, again, um, Latin America has also received uh, substantial support uh, in the early years. It's clear that uh, Latin America managed in general to grow out of uh, the crisis that hit around the 19, uh, uh, early 1980s. But it's clear that countries like Nicaragua, like Bolivia, uh, for example, are still receiving a substantial amount uh, of, of, of support. It's clear that um, when you're looking to the Middle East, uh, it's very clear that um, there are countries there that have received substantial uh, support. But some of those countries have also had substantial income from oil resources. Yeah. Uh, and therefore have uh, more been on the donor side. I mean, we saw when the oil prices increased in the uh, 1970s, we actually saw uh, some Middle Eastern countries entering the aid scene, uh, uh, scene as donors uh, and, and, and basically tried uh, to provide aid, which was essentially recycling some of the money that they had earned from the high oil prices. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, of course, over the years, uh, the, 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 the nature of, of aid regimes has, has evolved. I know that you have written quite a bit on this. I mean, so can you, can you give us a bit of, a, of an overview of how, over the years, I mean, aid regimes have evolved? And I, I would assume that, you know, when it comes to the way, for instance, the U.S., I mean, when it comes to the way the, the Western countries uh, conceive, or conceive of aid, I mean, the U.S., France, the U.K., and so on, it's a bit different from the way it is conceived in, uh, or was conceived in the context of the USSR, and then it's a bit different from the way that it has been conceived in the context of Japan, and now with the new donors. So can you tell us a bit about the, the, the variety of aid regimes existing, the similarities, the differences, and, and how the, the, the thinking has evolved over the years? Yeah, I, I think one thing that is important, uh, which we have already alluded to, is that there are very few countries that give things for complete free. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think it is important to, uh, to recognize that up front. Uh, it is clear that when you look to the major donors, it is clear that the strategic and political motivations have been there. Um, I have made reference to uh, US support to uh, Israel and, and, and Egypt. Um, you can make similar references to the um, support from the Soviet Union to countries like Angola or countries like Mozambique in, 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 in Africa. So those motivations have always been there, and it would have been naive to, to, to talk about uh, the aid process without being aware uh, of these factors uh, within the big scheme of things. I think it's also fair to say, and, and, and our analysis, when you actually try to go in, um, you do see uh, that foreign aid, in general, tends to be actually influenced by the degree of poverty. In other words, it's not such that the political motivations completely override uh, the poverty objective. It is coming out in the analysis that the extent of poverty, it is also a driver of uh, um, foreign aid allocations. Mm -hmm. Now, I think that it's very clear uh, that if you, for example, take uh, the Nordic countries, yes. they typically have not had um, specific political motivations in relation to specific countries, at least not in the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, but it's clear that as time has gone by, sometimes you have built up uh, different links. It's pretty easy to understand why France is focusing or has been uh, focusing on former French colonial uh, colonies in Africa. Uh, there is a history, there is a background, and in some cases there has also been a French uh, ambition uh, to remain influential. Um, but does all this mean that there hasn't been a desire to um, help, to address needs? I, I would say there has. Mm -hmm. I think, think one of the issues that has been very interesting to follow uh, in relation to sort of more Western-based type aid, is the very specific change that took place around 1980 where the conditionality discussion uh, really very much set in. And I think that was an experience uh, where this thing that, 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 that there are actually conditions associated um, was, was brought home to a lot of uh, actors in, in this. Then it became clear that those conditions were not always functioning very well. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, because some of those conditions were probably not the most appropriate. But secondly, also because when you are in such a game, the game of giving and receiving, um, and where the giver, where the donor, to some extent has to be in that game for all kinds of reasons, then there can be strength and weakness and weakness in strength. What I mean by that is that the recipient may be weak but has some strength because the donor wishes to continue to give the aid. So maybe conditions don't necessarily have to be fulfilled. Mm -hmm. Kenya did not over and over again actually fulfill the conditions that they had agreed to and so on. Yes. But um, another aspect has been that the concerns that have been driving uh, Western aid have changed a lot. 
we started to be concerned about growth. Then we got very much concerned about poverty. Then we got very much concerned about macroeconomic management and stability. Then we got very much concerned about governance and democracy. Now we are gradually getting more concerned about environment, uh, environment and sustainability. So what you can see is that you had a very considerable agenda that has been changing a lot. And it has not always been easy to, how can you say, situate yourself in that. Uh, so uh, w what is it now that needs to be the priority? If you go to uh, the way, for example, that uh, China is now uh, uh, collaborating and is now appearing more and more on the scene, they are distinctly more commercial. Japan has been also distinctly more commercial uh, in the way in which they have approached uh, the, the, the aid process. W the Western countries were also, uh, and a lot of, for example, support was given uh, to mobilize the involvement of Western companies and so on. But in a big part of this discussion, we never really liked that. Mm -hmm. We felt that was not really uh, sort of uh, what it should be somehow. Uh, because we felt that tying, and we showed that with our analysis, that when you tie your aid, it's actually not as useful to the recipient as it could be. <laughs> there, there have been very few excuses on the side of uh, Japan and China in this case. It has been strictly defined as mutually beneficial commercial relations. Mm -hmm. And that has then been supported by the, uh, by the aid flows. Um, this, of course, is then also reinforced by the Chinese more traditional way. We will not interfere in the local domestic political issues. We will basically deal with the government that's there, and that has not always been the position of uh, foreign aid from the Western countries. In some cases, like the uh, South African case, well, foreign aid directly went in and tried to promote what you could call regime shift. Mm -hmm. I mean, the first regime shift was actually not uh, higher up in Africa. It, it was actually a target uh, when you were talking about South Africa. There was a lot of aid that was provided to help uh, South Africans in exile and so on, and was actually very helpful to the changing process in South Africa, for example. So, so Finn, you, you gave us uh, a lot here. So. Let's unpack a little bit, if you will. Yes, uh, I first understand. of all, the the, the, the notion of uh, uh, conditionality. You mentioned that it became part of a, a central part of the of the public discourse on aid in the early 90s. So, how did it come to be such a, a key feature of the public discourse on aid uh, in the early 90s? This notion of conditionality. It was about I, I, effectiveness I, of aid, essentially. I, I think. Well, uh, not only. Um, but also, it's very clear that um, as you came to the end of the 1970s, the perception and understanding that the aid was maybe not as effective as it could be because the, the projects that we have promoted with aid, the return to those projects were maybe not as high as it should be because the overall macroeconomic situation was not promoting general economic development. If you build a road, but you don't make it profitable for people to use that road, if you make investments that will only yield a return if the economy is generally working and, 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 and properly functioning, uh, then you need to think about the system. Mm -hmm. Now then what happened was that the approach became very much driven um, by the uh, IMF and the World Bank. And it's very clear that there was a strong political shift uh, around 1980 to a much more uh, liberal approach to economic policy. What we call neoclassical economic thinking uh, became much more influential. I mean, in the US, Reagan came in, and in, in, in the UK, uh, Thatcher came in. So what, what really happened? was that there was this idea that you need to essentially make developing countries 
pursue liberalist policies. To do that, you give them some money such that they feel that they can manage the short-run cost of these liberal policies. Now, of course, that created a lot of debate because, first of all, it's not obvious that the liberalist policies as they were defined then were the most appropriate. It led to, for example, the closing down of quite a few institutions that we are today now struggling to rebuild. Um, but secondly, also the process uh, by which these conditionalities were imposed was often very, very harsh. And the negotiating uh, process uh, was often not felt as balanced. Mm -hmm. So you had foreign donors and the institutions like the World Bank and IMF, they would arrive and say, yes, we understand your economy is in difficulty. Yes, we will provide you with resources. But, and then you would come out with a long list of things that you had to do. Mm -hmm. Now, um, these were demands, these were conditionalities, and sometimes some of those conditionalities did not really make that much sense. Mm -hmm. It went overboard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can give you uh, a small example. I was myself at that time working as advisor in Mozambique, and we were desperately looking for yet another price to liberalize. And then finally I came up with the idea that maybe we should add the price of turkeys and liberalize that one. Mm -hmm. uh, and then subsequently uh, I have been asking a lot of people, how many turkeys do you think Mozambique was producing? So it, it simply went overboard. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then also gradually it became understood that in many cases the countries actually did not even implement these conditionalities. So that clearly became understood as a dysfunctional aid relationship. But I think that um, this aspect that the aid relation um, has an element of negotiation or conditionality inherent in it should not be uh, just thrown away. Mm -hmm. It's much better that the contract, that the agreement is made explicit mm -hmm. so, so that the different parties, that they feel some commitment, that they are aware of, of, of what's involved. So, um, so, so, so conditionality uh, thing is about uh, accountability in a way, but it has to be done in a, in a, in a, in a reasonable way uh, for, for both parties, right? I, I mean, as I see it, I basically understand the aid relationship, and at least the way I prefer to think about it, is that you have a richer partner, mm -hmm. the donor, you have a poor, poorer partner, the recipient. Um, these two engage in a transfer of resources, and the purpose of that transfer of resources is to help develop mm -hmm. the poorer partner and its population. Now, there are lots of problems in that because, for example, one thing that can go wrong is that that transfer of resources, it may only, for example, be helping the upper echelons of a country. Mm -hmm. um, helping a country is not necessarily helping the poorest people in that country. Mm -hmm. So that's just, just one aspect. But I don't think that we should run away from the fact that there is an element of agreement and, 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 and I have in all of the many years I've been working on these issues I have never really found a donor that did not have something that it wanted to be achieved yeah. and, and I find that perfectly uh, acceptable okay. Absolutely. Yes. I, 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 I yeah. mean um, why should a country like let's just take Sweden uh, if Sweden's aid is motivated by the fact that you want to help the poorest of the poor which is an objective that I personally ascribe to, which is uh, one of the reasons why I'm working at WIDA, because this is what we are concerned about, then I think that it is appropriate that Sweden as a donor uh, tries to put these issues on the agenda. Yeah, but of course, 
It needs to be a partnership. A partnership. It can't be that it's just the one side that imposes. The, the, the other set of issues uh, that you uh, touched upon uh, in your very rich uh, uh, comments earlier uh, have to do with the fact that over time, you know, we, 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 um, uh, our concerns evolved. You know, we started with growth, then poverty, then macroeconomic stability, then governance democracy, then environmental uh, uh, and sustainable and st sustainability, and finally, uh, um, I don't know the the, the, the the I don't recall the last notion, but I mean, so I guess it makes sense. But has the problems uh, evolved? I guess that the concerns evolve. But I mean, you know, how, how would you explain such an, an evolution in the concerns on which over over the years uh, we have focused in the in the in the context of development aid? Yeah. Is it that we I learn from our mistakes? Is it that we? Uh, we, uh, the, the agenda changed. Um... Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I, again here, I, I, I apologize, but, but, no, no, but, but okay. I do think, I, I do think that, that um, how can you say, there are various aspects in here. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's very clear that clearly the agendas, uh, in terms of the of the core challenges, have been changing. Mm -hmm. um, it's very clear, for example, that the fact that uh, uh, environment and sustainability is now much higher on the uh, agenda and, and, and the concern, I think is, is, is a relatively clear one. Fifteen years ago, we were still discussing whether uh, climate change and, and in increased uh, temperature and so on, whether that was really a serious issue. Uh, we now know today that it is. Um, I think that uh, we have also learned, for example, that uh, growth is not enough. So the focus on addressing poverty directly was not just uh, because somebody certainly felt that, oh, it's, 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 it's bad to be poor. I mean, we know that. It is bad to be poor. There's nothing romantic about being poor. But the question, of course, is how do we address that poverty? It became understood that previous periods of uh, acceptance that maybe you have to have uh, some inequality, uh, that was challenged. I mean, if you go back to the old economic theories, it was actually felt that some inequality was a good thing. Why? Because the richer will save more than the poor. Mm -hmm. And that will then help the growth process. That was for good reasons challenged, because inequality generates political instability, and actually it's not at all clear that the richer save more when it comes to uh, the development aspects than, than the poor. Uh, lots of the savings that the poor do were overlooked. So there has been a lot of learning going on. Now, um, some people would say, oh, the donors have learned nothing. Uh, they are just the same, uh, driven completely by their own interests, be that uh, their interests within the aid institutions or by the donor countries. I don't think that's right. Uh, am I saying that the donors are always behaving very nicely? No, I'm not saying that. Uh, I, I think I have also already tried to illustrate the importance of political objectives and so on. And clearly there are aid officials that are part of this game because they're having a job. They're having a good job, they're having a relatively well-paid job, uh, etc. But that's not the same as saying that there is no learning going on. And when you actually look to um, the initiatives that have been taken, th there has been an, a, a, a substantial amount of trying to adjust to new needs. The introduction, for example, of the adjustment uh, uh, loans and so on in the early 1980s, that was a pretty clear illustration of the fact that you tried to move from one modality to another one. Th then there has also been uh, a relatively, I think, high degree of, of naivety at times. Um, I mean, for example, sometimes it's said that, oh, uh, we need to achieve perfect coordination of aid. Um, my question in, when that's being put on the table is that I, I think coordination can be a good thing, but, but tell me, um, in this world of ours, uh, do the donor countries always coordinate on other things? No, sometimes they have inherent contradictions. Sometimes they are perceiving different objectives. 
And uh, when you go to individual uh, developing countries, it's not always a good thing for the developing country that everything is completely coordinated from outside. It can actually be to the benefit of the recipient that there is some flexibility. Flexibility is not necessarily a bad thing. A bad thing, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the, 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 the third point that, uh, uh, that you, you alluded to had to do with the, the, the commercial nature of uh, uh, development aid when it comes to, to Japan and China. So, so w what is the, the rationale uh, to this uh, commercial nature and why is it that they have followed this path which is quite different from the one of, of the Nordic countries, of uh, the Western powers in general? What, how do you explain this path? I, I think that what is involved here are long histories that are really complex to how can you say explain in all their details mm -hmm. but it is probably um, how can you say a focus on the fact that growth is important I think that this is part of this understanding that um, you know if the, if, if, if the pie is too small the pie needs to grow and I think that um, that focus is probably an important part of why they do it the way they do, plus the historical and political and other reasons. It would be hard to expect uh, China to go out and uh, be pursuing um, uh, governance uh, issues such as uh, democracy and others, um, simply because their own uh, system at home uh, has developed in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that, that, that that's relatively clear. Um, and I think it is fair to say um, that you can develop countries with quite a broad range of political regimes. They can still grow, um, and, and, and uh, it is certainly not clear. Um, democracy, for example, just to illustrate, uh, democracy in itself, in my assessment, in my value judgment, is a good thing in itself. And, and, and I... Uh, have been willing uh, to say that it forms part of my value set. Would I be uh, able to go out and say that to grow and develop you need democracy as a precondition? I, I cannot say so because uh, you have seen development in Vietnam, you have seen development in China, you have seen development in Taiwan, you have seen development uh, in Korea under circumstances You've seen development in a number of African countries. You could not consider those countries as democratic. Mm -hmm. Do I believe that gradually, that eventually, a development process will push democratic issues on the agenda? Yes, I believe that. Mm -hmm. um, do I believe that democracy is in the way of development? No, I don't believe that. Um, but there is sort of... Uh, th 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 this is where these are difficult um, you know, issues because the, the, what we sometimes call causal relationship is very complex. So it's, it's about the interplay between the, uh, if you will, uh, the economic agenda or the development agenda and the political agenda. Absolutely. Uh, uh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, another point, uh, Finn, you know, uh, traditionally uh, aid regimes have been, you know, about uh, north-south relationship, but now, of course, with the emergence of, uh, uh, you know, new countries, China, Brazil, and so on, are we going to witness uh, a soft, soft uh, type of aid regime? I, I, I think there's no question that with the changes that are taking place in the global economy, uh, that a lot of what we have typically thought of as north-south relations, including age relations, are clearly going to change. We see that with China. Um, there is a lot of um, discussion about, for example, China's role in Africa. And I think that, that a lot of that discussion is uh, completely understood um, and understandable. Um, I think that there is some concern that's not always, um, how can you say, well justified, uh, because it's not like that, for example, African countries has, have always been treated nicely and been getting the best deal out of their interaction with Western countries. Uh, I mean, if you take some of the natural resource uh, extraction contracts, 
Um, I mean, you cannot point always to that to having been good deals for African countries. Um, what you can hope is that that greater plurality, that greater uh, number of actors can be helpful uh, in generating uh, what you can consider uh, a much more optimal uh, situation. We normally actually like to think that an element of competition is not a bad thing. Uh, so I, I would tend to suggest that there are probably possibilities here, um, and, and sometimes there are also uh, dilemmas. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's clear that um, you know you can say that some things have been achieved in terms of the democracy agenda. It's clear that one would not hope that there are going to be backlashes to that. Um, but I do believe that, that, that it is a good thing that former developing countries, that they now enter the scene and put their experience on the table. Because that can help in, how can you say, getting a more informed aid debate and a more for informed discussion. And actually one of the reasons why I'm working a lot on the aid issues is because I actually believe that there are quite a few cases where aid has played a good role. Um, you can point to that in a number of countries, and I think that there are also situations where aid has not played a good role, but it's, after all, one of the few uh, links or possibilities we have through public money to influence what's going on. But precisely, Finn, you know, um do you think that uh, the, the fact that we're going to, that we're in the process of adding to the north-south dimension, the the, the uh, uh, south-south dimension to to to, uh, to development aid regimes is going to change the nature of the debates on, on development aid and is going to change somehow um, uh, how we, we we critically think about uh, uh, development aid. You know, as you know, uh, in recent years. Uh, uh, aid has been criticized a lot. So do you think that these uh, you know, important uh, changes are going to somehow reshape the debates? I, I, I mean, I, I, let me say that I, um, I think um, that um, the debates are not going to go away. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I, th I, I think that there will continue to be discussion about what is the most effective um, and good way to develop countries. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and the thing is that these are areas where we still have a lot to learn. And because somebody succeeded yesterday doing something does not mean that another country can do the same thing tomorrow. These continue to be very complex areas. Um, what I'm saying is that I think that the greater plurality of actors on the aid scene a scene uh, can help make sure that different dimensions and different perspectives are being brought to bear. And that, I believe, uh, will be useful. I, I, I do not think that the critical voices uh, in relation to uh, development aid uh, are going to stop easily. Mm -hmm. uh, some of that uh, criticism comes from a deep felt concern uh, that the whole aid relationship is not a good one. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think that those kinds of concerns are going to go away, uh, uh, you know, very quickly. B because those concerns will also be there uh, thinking about uh, aid between um, a former developing country and a still developing country. So that, mm -hmm. I think, will still be there. Um, but I do believe... Um, that having the aid as part of a bigger, more complex set where more actors are there and where former developing countries will be part of the decision-making, I do believe that that is going to be helpful. And I actually am convinced that that would be useful for the overall aid debate. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and when it comes to the criticism addressed to, to aid, I guess that it comes both from developed countries and developing countries. When it comes from developing countries, I guess, but it has to do with uh, perhaps uh, uh, unequal partnership, paternal paternalism, uh, the wrong ideology. And when it comes to developed countries, it, I guess it has to do with uh, 
corruption, lack of effectiveness, lack of coordination. So, you know, if you if you wanted to list the, the, the criticisms coming from both sides, what would be yeah. the key criti criticisms? Well, I mean, I, I think that, uh, well, you, you, you practically already mentioned them. I mean, I think that uh, on the recipient side, wh wh why, uh, why would you be, uh, um, how can you say, um, uh, critical? Why would you be uh, cautious and so on? Well, because aid has often been very paternalistic. Um, aid has often um, uh, been mistargeted. Uh, aid has certainly uh, been part of processes that were not partnership processes. Um, aid has clearly been used um, for uh, foreign advisors who have not always been effective. So you can mention many of those uh, kind of characteristics. From the donor side, from the uh, uh, origin side, well, you see that um, aid has sometimes been going to corrupt regimes. Uh, you can see that aid has sometimes had incentive effects which were not... Um, uh, productive. Um, there is a discussion, for example, about where, whether aid can lead to the over, overvaluation of the exchange rate so that the aid comes in and maybe it does some good things, but then at the same time it leads to decrease in the economic competitiveness such that countries don't export. Now, um, there, are, th th there are elements of truth in lots of these observations. Now, what, what I think is part of a problem uh, in the debates that we are having about aid is that a lot of the criticism doesn't always feel the responsibility to establish the empirical importance of the different arguments. Mm -hmm. In other words, um, uh, let, let's say that uh, we take a country and let's say that we then discuss, okay, we are now going to make a resource transfer to, to, to that country, and we then say, oh, uh, that has a tendency to make people lazy. And then, because of that, you're critical. A lot of the criticism that's there has not always felt the responsibility to establish the actual dimension of that laziness that then occurs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, and that is what makes these kinds of debates sometimes very difficult. Mm -hmm. I, I, for one, and I would like to say that very clearly, I mean, I have been working half my working life, actually more, uh, in developing country context, so to some extent I feel myself uh, as much as a developing country individual, and, and I'm capable of seeing how some of these aid relations have a tendency not to be focused right, and so on. For me, there is one question, however, is on balance, what is the situation? On balance, does it add or does it subtract? And, and it is that discussion about on balance mm -hmm. where I think I would like to see a little bit more, um, if you wish, balanced debate about the pros and the cons and how you improve the pros, and how you try to counteract the cons. Mm -hmm. So that you can, how can you say, um, uh, become more effective. And yes, I do believe uh, that that sort of balanced discussion is, is not there at present. Um, why? Because there is a tendency to divide the debate up in two polarized views. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, you have those who say, oh, aid works 24 hours a day throughout the world, and on the other side, you have a camp that says, oh, ever never works, never does anything good, actually it's harmful. But the fact of the matter is, in my assessment is, that the truth is somewhere in between. In the middle, yeah. mm -hmm. That aid is part of a relationship, and I have seen aid doing a lot of good things, but I have also seen a lot of aid being wasted. Mm -hmm. So the issue is, is, is sort of, how do we improve that?
And, and precisely as, as, as we are reaching the end of our conversation, she, and uh, I know that you, you, you have a very lucid, because we spoke about it before, assessment uh, of, of, of the aid situation. You, 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 you see the, 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 the pluses and the minuses. So, and of course, you know, as you are committed to, 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 to this uh, issue, you, you want to push as much as possible the, the, the pluses, the, the positive aspects. So if you had to, to make a number of, uh, of intellectual policy uh, uh, institutional recommendations to really push forward the, the pluses of aid, what would be your, your key recommendations? And how would you go about making sure that they become part of, of reality? Yeah. I, I think one very important aspect is that the partnership that we referred to before is taking really, really serious. So that both the donor and the recipient, that they mutually understand and mutually agree to why they are actually engaging in this partnership. Mm -hmm. And that you, that you really take that partnership serious. And that you don't, how can you say, let uh, minor swings in either fashion or whatever make you then certainly want to do something completely different. If we want to have an effective educational uh, collaboration program, that cannot be done if you just have a five-year time horizon. Mm -hmm. it, it cannot be done. To, to get people to the PhD level, how many years does it take? Well, if you start with the children of today, they first have to go to primary school, then they have to go to secondary school, then they have to go to high school, then they have to go to university. And only after that process are you actually starting to have people who are then trained. One of the interesting things in some of the work that we have been doing, uh, trying to understand the relationship between aid and growth, is that those effects of aid you can only find those when you look over 30, 40 years. So my suggestion is make sure that you are aware that development is long term. Yeah. You are not going to achieve these things in the very short term. When it comes to education, when it comes to health, it's almost self-evident. But Effective aid needs to be aid that is mutually understood by both parties and that doesn't swing just because fashion changes. Mm -hmm. I believe personally that there has been another area that has tended to receive much too less uh, attention, uh, at least in the African case, um, in light of the Millennium Development Goals. I think that the Millennium Development Goals have been a very good um, initiative. I think it has attracted a lot of attention to serious, important goals in the international development debate, and a lot of mobilization around it has taken place. I think that's a very good thing. I also think, and, and this also comes out from when we're looking at our uh, foreign aid numbers, is that this has, among other things, led to, for example, that when you see the amount of aid resources that goes into health and education and compare that to what goes into agriculture, there seems to be not a balance here. Mm -hmm. And, um, I mean, if you think about what people need in order to make a living, well, you have to make agriculture work in Africa. Mm -hmm. You have to make the economy work. I think that possibly here we have not had sufficient uh, assessment of the dilemmas or the trade-offs. So, so in essence, this Finn, is one area, that, for example. Yeah, and Anna, this is a good point. So in essence, uh, Finn, you are saying that when it comes to the NDGs, uh, the, the focus has been too much on the, 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 the social and economic rights, if you will, uh, and not enough uh, on the means to somehow uh, you know, engineer and make this uh, the fulfillment of these social and economic rights sustainable. We we haven't focused on on agriculture, on on economics, and and maybe we haven't focused enough either on on governance and on the uh, interactions between the private sector and the public sector. Yeah. Now, I, I mean, 
I, I, I believe very, very strongly uh, in the UN principles and that uh, we as human beings, we have rights. Mm -hmm. But it is also our duty to work and continue to work on thinking about and working on how do we achieve yeah. more people getting access to these rights. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 I happen to believe that, and this is one of the reasons why I, I am an economist uh, and I have stayed being an economist, even though I have broad range of interest, is because I do believe that putting the economy to work is an important element of making sure that people get access to these rights, at least when you're talking about uh, rights to shelter, rights to yeah. food, right, and so on. Yeah. Uh, two follow-up questions, uh, uh, Finn, as a way to perhaps end our conversation. You talked, uh, you talked about the, 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 the uh, essential need to be focused on the long term, and, and yet very often, you know, uh, donors, I mean, be, be private donors, public donors, even NGOs are very much, you know, eager to get uh, quick results. So how do you balance uh, the need to show uh, quick results, which is supposed to be the, the part of the culture of the time, and this long-term commitment? And then second follow-up question, um, you, you talk about the need to really have uh, uh, a greater emphasis on agriculture, the, I mean, the needs to achieve these rights. What about the leadership dimension? I mean, the, the human dimension at the top, because unless you have people at the top committed to really the welfare of the country and of, of, of uh, people, well, chances are that it's not going to happen. So first of all, the, you know, the tension between long term and short term. I, I, honestly, I don't think there's any simple answer to that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, 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 this is a constant balancing that you constantly have to face. Um, I'm just stressing um, that um, in order to have long-term uh, a favorable increased uh, uh, impact, you need to think long-term. So I'm suggesting that make sure that you don't always just get captured by the short-run uh, dimensions uh, because in that way you are likely not to have the longer term uh, impact that you are looking for. And I mentioned the uh, education human uh, capacity building as, as one dimension. Um, th th there are clearly other dimensions. I don't uh, think, for example, that in the foreign aid area that we have worked enough on trying to think about how foreign aid can help mobilize uh, private, private flows. I mean, one way of uh, seeing higher impact of the foreign aid is if we can help mobilize uh, the, the private resources. If we can use the public money as a way to help mobilize more private money. Some work has been done, mm -hmm. but I think more can be done. Mm -hmm. and, and that, I think, uh, goes to your questions about the issues of, of the balance between the private and the public sector. I mean, for me, a lot of foreign aid is public money, and it continues to be. Now, and this is one reason why I say that that public money should not necessarily be used only uh, for things that private money could do. No, in fact, that public money should be used for things that only public money can do, and then the private money should move in and do what private money can do. Mm -hmm. And the issue of leadership... Yes, um, I, I belong to those who have a very strong sense that leadership is an important element of success. Um, I believe that Africa, for example, in some cases has been very unfortunate uh, to have leaders that did not keep in mind the interest of their nation and their people. Um, but this is not exceptional for Africa. Uh, we have seen that in Europe. I mean, I come from uh, a now well-established country, and I can't say that all those kings that we've had over the years, that they always had the best interest of our country in mind. So um, do I believe that uh, trying to make efforts to develop uh, high quality of leadership, I think that's important. That's one of the reasons why, for example, I think that when I'm talking about training and education and building up. Uh, and when I, for example, say that I think we are now at a point 
where more emphasis should be given to a higher level education, it is because I do believe um, that at some point it is true that maybe you can educate also the last 10% of the primary, but you need to think about that that group of analysts, leaders, decision makers, they have to have the necessary training and background. Mm -hmm. And th there is no denial, as far as I'm concerned, that proper leadership can play a key role in making sure that you succeed. Yeah. Um, and I believe that aid can also be used for that. Yeah. And, and maybe, Finn, a final question. I mean, uh, I know that you don't have a crystal ball, but I mean, uh, how, how do you see the, 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 the future of development aid? I mean, uh, are we going to go, are, are we going to be able to go beyond the uh, criticisms and are, are we going to be able to go forward in a positive and constructive fashion? I, I don't think that uh, both uh, positive and negative debate is going to stop tomorrow. I think that we're going to see a situation where you're going to have both, how can you say, uh, what I see as the constructive thinking about how we improve and so on, as well as the, uh, if you wish, more negative or, or acid uh, debates. Why? Uh, because it's part of public uh, uh, debates and uh, hitting the front pages of the newspaper, sometimes you have to come up uh, with these rather negative Uh, single standing stories, um, do I believe that we, are, we have increasing potential for having constructive debates? Yes, I do so. Why do I believe that? Well, because we are now seeing increasingly that we have more information, more data building up. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that we are now in a situation actually to clarify debates that maybe we couldn't clarify 10, 15 years ago. Because 10, 15 years ago, we would sit there and we would say, oh, our, our analysis cannot really reach um, a clear conclusion. Now, as more data and more information and more experience builds up, in some cases, can we come with clearer answers? In some cases, we don't have to just be on the one hand and on the other hand. We can actually, in some cases, come out and say, look, Aid has played a constructive role here and here. Mm -hmm. Here is more uncertain, but on balance we can say such and such. Focus on making things better rather than throwing it completely out. I mean, I, I know this sounds a little bit theoretical, but what I'm trying to convey is that as we have more experience building up, it also becomes clearer and more easy, more possible for us as researchers to come out with clear answers. Mm -hmm. So a, a more uh, uh, tailored approach to, to, to problems. Yeah. T -t Take one very simple case. Um, if you want to understand what's happening, it's very often a good, time, a good idea to look what happened over, let's say, 25 years. Mm -hmm. When you have 25 years of experience, you have a better chance for understanding what has been the relationship between aid and development in a particular country. Yeah. That's very difficult when you only have five or ten years. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. wh why am I, for example, saying that I have seen aid doing uh, good supportive things? Because I have been part of a process in Mozambique mm -hmm. where there can be no discussion, both analytically, but also politically and otherwise, that you have seen a, 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 a progress. Are there challenges today? We saw aid being helpful in reconstructing, in rebuilding, and so on. Now, there clearly is a challenge that the aid now needs to be very strong in building the institutions, in making sure that the parliament works, making sure that, uh, as well, the investments in getting the economy working are, ma are made. Mm -hmm. So, to some extent, the nature of the challenges change when you move from what was the Marshall Plan situation, reconstructing after war, to now a situation where it's not just reconstruction after war. Now it's more this making institutions work, making sure that you have training, education, and making the economy work.